Welcome back. It's still COVID-19 360. Now, we all can see the adverse effects that COVID-19 has had on our economy. Very, very bad. But even before that, a lot of people had lost their jobs. Businesses had shut down, of course, because of the financial sector crisis and, of course, the subsequent cleanup as well. Now, years before that, the country also battled a power crisis that left a lot of people losing their jobs and also had a lot of businesses shut down as well. People have been reeling from some of these uh, challenges. And then COVID-19 also hit. And now we're experiencing an economic fallout. What is the way forward? What can be done to ensure that a lot of these young people and a lot of these businesses recover and get back on track? Now, there's a group that believes that it's time for us to start talking about a social enterprise policy and fund because they believe this is what will bring about a lot of the change that we're looking forward to. And so let's have a conversation about that. What exactly do they mean by social enterprise policy and fund? Joining us this morning, I have Edwin Zukujo. He's the executive director for Social Enterprise Ghana. Also, Emmanuel Leslie Adai is the co-founder for the Africa Skills Hub. And we have Catherine Boafo. She's a CEO of Mau 20 Limited. Good morning, gentlemen, and thank you for joining us. All right, I'll start off with Edwin. You tell us, when we say social enterprise or social entrepreneurship, break it down for us, what does it necessarily mean? Thank you so much. For us, as social enterprise Ghana, we believe there is a new paradigm of thinking or business orientation that requires that thinking, that business is only for profit. It's just a bottom line. We believe that in this current uh, pandemic or COVID-19 situation, there is this new call for businesses that are people-centered, human-centered businesses that take into consideration that there are vulnerable people in their communities, that are poor, and there are marginalized people. So social entrepreneurship is basically using business strategies to provide market-led solutions for those at the bottom of the pyramid. Okay. It is thinking that we, as Social Enterprise Ghana Limited, are pushing together for all to understand and adopt as a business model in this current dynamic situation. Okay. Okay, so if we're talking about a policy, exactly what are we looking at? policy requires that there is the need for recognition to be given to that social enterprise umbrella of businesses mm. that will allow them to get very good tax incentives because they are working hand in hand with government in addressing the societal challenges faced by the youth, the poor, the vulnerable. So in working together with government, there is this need for business friendly environment and policy framework that works together with these enterprises or businesses in addressing the challenges that we face today. That is why we call on government and other relevant stakeholders in adopting and passing the social enterprise policy. I see. Thank you. All right. Does this in any way, Catherine, have um, you know, anything to do with the economic rights? Because we're talking about an advocacy here to get a policy uh, on social enterprise. What does it have in common with, uh, of course, the rights for economic advancement and all of that? Yes, um, thank you also for having me here. Um, it is very, very critical and important for us to have this economic rights um, forum or let's say conference. We are looking at having everyone in the need stage or at the grassroots coming up to a sustainable state so that businesses that are down and below and um, the yet-to-be entrepreneurs who are now upcoming mm. would have something to leverage on so that they can all rise up. We know that there are opportunities, but how to tap into it is even the problem. Mm -hmm. So we are in the right position to bring out such information together with stakeholders, duty bearers, and people who have the know-how, working hand-in-hand -hand with government to be able to bring such information and knowledge to the potential entrepreneur, young entrepreneur, or even the one who is yet to start up. We talk about students coming out of school, mm. not having jobs and all that. Um, we are actually doing this so that at the end of the day, 
will minimize the unemployment rate. At the end of the day, we have more entrepreneurs. We have a vibrant, um, a vibrant um, environment to work through. And okay. such policies are going to help organizations like Mal 20 as well, and the many other people within my environs who are also looking up to people like us, Social Enterprise Ghana, and other relevant stakeholders to leverage on the information they'll be getting to become better off than what they are today. And this, at the end of the day, solves problems in our environment. But one would argue that implementing a policy or putting together a policy is totally different from implementing it. And as a country, we've had challenges with ensuring that all these policies that have been brought up are implemented. So if we're asking for this, how are we going to ensure that beyond the policy it is being implemented? We have some uh, intervention uh, you know, campaigns by government. The NBSSI trying to support a lot of the micro, small and medium scale um, enterprises. We also have the entrepreneurship scheme under the Ghana Cares, which government is looking at, you know, working on and all of that. So are they not enough to ensure that we reduce the level of unemployment in the country instead of looking for a policy that may become, you know, a white elephant? Okay. So the policy would definitely not be a white elephant. This is because NBSSI has a role to play, but NBSSI cannot go everywhere. Social enterprise is a united body with its members, and we have similar roles to play. We have roles bordering on advocacy, policy, training, research, market access, um, and so many others, finance and others. For my company, I've even benefited from social enterprise. I've had trainings, mm. and one is on training the trainer on economic rights. My company is better off today because of the trainings I've had. I'm doing better today because of the trainings I've had. And we are looking forward that this policies when passed will make the environment for social enterprises more friendly. Okay. I'm not supposed to pay same taxes like the ordinary business person because at the end of the day, my profits are coming back into the business to help solve problems in my, um, in my jurisdiction. So if I'm doing the same thing that my colleagues are doing, and yet I'm still solving a problem. Government is also supposed to do something to make me thrive and make me work better than, you know, the, ad, uh, the other businesses. Because what we are doing is not just taking profits and then enjoying our profit, but profits mm. change the lives of other people. At the end of the day, we are all going to have better economic livelihood. So the policy, the policy is not going to be a white elephant. No way. We are very united and we are strong. Absolutely. Emmanuel, let me bring you into this conversation. Tell me more about, uh, you know, this advocacy and what other things you have to say about why it should be implemented, the policy. Okay, Mary, thank you for having me. So, I mean, social enterprise is basically about, so Catherine is one of our members. I mean, they are supporting the ecosystem and they focus on impact. So at this moment, we are trying to, the advocacy is all about um, identifying the vulnerable women and youth in our community and helping them to identify their economic rights in the community to be able to stand and able to also able to stand on their own and perform whatever right they have in the community. We realize that there are a lot of vulnerable women and youth in our community who doesn't even know what is happening in this in the community. For example, when NBSI came out to announce the COVID fund, how many of the businesses that were aware of this opportunity in the, in the ecosystem. They were not even aware, most of them were not even aware. How many people are able to walk into NEP office to ask for facility from them to help their businesses? How many people are able to walk direct to Ministry of Ministry of Health yeah. or Ministry of Women and Gender Affairs to even to, to ask for whatever um, they are they are they are they have a privilege to to ask to, to get. Uh -huh. These are things that we have to look as as a, as a as a unit, as a body, we can come out to adv advocate for such such economic rights for these vulnerable people in our community. So they're able to demand what is what is right to them and able to fulfill whatever uh, business or opportunity that they have in the community. And so basically, the advocacy is all about uh, bringing together the vulnerable in our community. So we have regional, regional elites across the country that are at, um, campaigning for this advocacy and um, trying to bring the vulnerable in their community and educating them on their economic rights in this country. How far have we gone with this campaign? I mean, we barely started um, a month ago. Um, so all of our original leads are, are, are on the same path with us. Mm. And currently, our crisis is here to take, I mean, take all those initiatives. 
So myself as a, as a member and also as a fan member of SC Ghana, I'm part of this advocacy campaign and we are here to organize this workshop with the vulnerable in our community that are around Kaneshi, Dansuman and Matai who um, educating them on their economic rights. So, I mean, we are late. We have up to end of the year to make sure that we're able to bring all those vulnerable in our community to the level where they can be able to stand on their own. I see. Edwin, um, have we had a chance to engage government in any way? Because like Emmanuel says, this started just about a month ago. And so how far have we gone in terms of roping government in and ensuring that eventually uh, we get a policy and a fund that supports the vulnerable in society? Thank you. In all our endeavors, government is one of the major stakeholders that we engage on a regular basis. Okay. So from all the ministries, Ministry of Trade and Industry, Ministry of Business Development, Ministry of Finance. Indeed, that was last year, we did organize the SDG Investment Fair with the Ministry of Finance. And in the December of last year, we also did organize the Made in Ghana Fair with the Ministry of Trade and Industry. Mm -hmm. So we, together with government, are in good step. Indeed, all the activities and engagements that we are having is to bridge the gap between government and the beneficiaries and citizens. Okay. So that they will get to know the programs, the activities of government and get educated on the best ways to access those services and programs and policies developed by government. So we see government as, one of, uh, as a major stakeholder in all our engagements and activities. I see. And we're looking forward to a lot more. But when is your next program and what would it be focusing on? I know Emmanuel had mentioned something about another, um, you know, I guess in other regions involved as well. But when is your next engagement? Edwin, can, can you hear me, Edwin? Emmanuel, yes. I'll, I'll take that from you then before I bring in Catherine. I think we lost. Okay, Edwin is back. Let's see if Edwin can respond to this. Yes, this is a nationwide engagement of government, duty bearers, and relevant stakeholders. So on weekly, daily basis, from across board in all the regions, our members are regularly engaging relevant stakeholders and duty bearers. So we started last two weeks in the northern parts of Ghana, upper west region, upper east region, and the northern region, and they trade almost 200 vulnerable women and youth mm. on their rights. Okay. Last year, there was a major event in Kumasi through to Sunyani, where about 100 youth and women, even physically challenged people, were educated on how to access government services and economy rights. I see. And then it continues with meeting of these duty barriers, where we could access and get educated on the relevant policies, programs, and activities of government, mm. and how our members and other duty bearers and beneficiaries can assess those activities. Okay, Catherine, let me bring you in now. Break it down for us, because some people may be watching and saying, we've talked about social enterprise, we've talked about economic rights. What are my economic rights? Okay, so your economic rights basically are partially political rights, rights for you to have finance, rights for you to have other health, or let's say social amenities, let's say like the NHIS, rights to vote when it comes to politics. But we are measuring on the economic rights for people to thrive when it comes to businesses. Mm. So what we are saying is that all the opportunities available, financial opportunities, Opportunities, opportunities for our beneficiaries to know how they can even loan or a loan from a mass lock and all that relevant stakeholders. We are saying that these are the economic rights we want these people to get to know about so that they can tap into it. There are many businesses who are not registered today mm -hmm. within my jurisdiction. And if you are not registered, how do you even tap into opportunities? Absolutely. So we are coming along with all these relevant stakeholders, NBSSI, um, Register General, mm. and the rest. And they'll give them the information. They are going to hear some of those words from the mouth of the relevant stakeholders. 
And then they can now apply for some of the opportunities because they will definitely have a feedback session too, okay. where some of them will go through it and be able to say, okay, through this, this is the impact I have had. This is the knowledge I have. And this is how much I'm willing to go. And we are not going to leave them behind. Mm. We are actually going to hold their hands. Mount Kenny will hold the hands of people around Fokwase, Amasaman, you know, in Sawam or Fanko, because this is where we are located. And we want to see the youth here thriving as well. Does this involve, and let me bring Emmanuel to respond to this, does this involve the, uh, a, a, a level of the informal sector? Because we see a lot of people who sell on the streets, um, you know, probably not aware of the economic rights when it comes to this discussion in particular. Then also we have a chunk of entrepreneurs operating on social media. So again, a lot of them are not registered. Um, does it involve a lot of these people and how do you rope them in, especially the informal sector? Um, um, so Bella, I mean, when you talk about vulnerable uh, women in the community, I mean, definitely informal sector is a chunk of this um, group. And so looking at our work that we are doing around Kaneshi, Mataiku, and Tansuma India, we are focusing on that um, group of people who don't have access to, who are lacking access to information, and also who are not, who are the informal sector. Mm. So we are looking at the Kaye, California people, those who business are not ready, those who sell on the tables, and those who are even sell on their, on their heads. These are people that we are engaging, okay. making sure that they're able to ask government services that they, they have a common right to to be able to grow their business and also to be able to grow themselves. So we are looking at those sectors. I mean that's why we are doing this as well. But these people would say that they'll be heavily taxed if they register, um, you know, and so these are some of the reasons why they try to avoid some of these issues when they come up. So how are you going to convince them? Even though, of course, we know that once you run a business, you should pay your taxes. But of course, it, they, they would look at the amounts that will go into paying taxes, first of all, before anything. I mean, Bella, when we talk about advocacy, it's all part of the advocacy are doing. So first of all, it's to be educating them mm. for them to understand that it's not all about taxing them on their business that they, they run, but it's about them being part of that a whole a, a ecosystem where they can even access those government benefits. For example, when this NBSI fund was available, yeah. if you're not registered, you can't get you can't. this fund. Mm -hmm. And it's about the benefit that they can get when you get registered. So it's part of that advocacy. First, it's educating them, and before you bring them to a level that they can be able to access them. So it's part of the advocacy we are doing. As Absolutely. As Final words, Edwin, before we go. So what do you have to say about this particular issue? Thank you so much. We here would like to engage government and encourage government that for the need for individuals and citizens to have a dignified life, quality of life and improved standard of living, they need to engage business associations like us who are working to solve and work together in solving the situations and challenges of the vulnerable communities. Indeed, COVID-19 COVID has affected a lot of businesses, the vulnerable communities, and the youth. We will encourage government to work with us so that we can develop solutions, policies, and funds that go directly to improve the livelihood and economic situations of these marginalized communities. Mm. Thank you so much. And we engage and encourage media to work with us as we work with government in providing these market-led solutions to the vulnerable communities to make them their lives improved and enjoy a quality of life. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you all for speaking to us. Edwin Zukujo is the executive director for the Ghana uh, Social Enterprise. And also Emmanuel Leslie Adai is the co-founder for Africa Skills Hub. And we also spoke to Catherine Boafo. She's the CEO of Mau 20 Limited. We'll be back.